Hello and welcome to the Polytechnic Role in Pandemic Recovery. Thank you for joining us. In the next hour, we will be taking a deeper dive into the Industry Strategy Council's recent report to the federal government and discussing how polytechnic institutions might help deliver on their recommendations. Established in May by the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, the Industry Strategy Council was asked to consider sectoral pressures resulting from the pandemic. A forum of 10 experienced business leaders representing key economic sectors came together to assess the impact of COVID-19 and coordinate input from the business community. Their report, released in December, provides a number of recommendations and guidance intended to support Canada's recovery. I'm very pleased to introduce today's panelists. Monique Leroux is the chair of the Industry Strategy Council and vice chairman at Fiera Holdings. John Baker, president and chief executive officer of D2L Corporation, will be representing the digital industries sector. Rhonda Barnett, president and chief operating officer at Avid Manufacturing, is representing the advanced manufacturing sector. Many thanks to all three of you for joining us today. And thank you also to Dr. Larry Rosia, President and Chief Executive Officer of Saskatchewan Polytechnic and the Board Chair at Polytechnics Canada, who will act as our moderator. Monique will now start us off with an overview of the Council's work. And thank you. So what I would like to propose, just to uh, put a, a context in, in the conversation, would be to cover with you uh, very briefly some slides. And after that, uh, we will go uh, into a, a very open uh, discussion. Uh, and I will encourage you, if you have you know, difficult questions for us, don't hesitate. We will be uh, you know, very happy to deal with that. Let's go with the first slide, if it's possible. And the first slide, it's about people. It's about you know, the council members, because I think it is important for you to have a sense of that. So you can see uh, on the slide, Rhonda, uh, representing advanced manufacturing, because the council is special. You have a group of people looking at the situation from a macro point of view, but also Rhonda and John are chair of the economic sectoral table looking at the particular sector. So you can see that uh, we had a very uh, interesting representation of sectors, but at the same time, a very interesting representation about where we are in this country from a regional point of view. We were very well supported also um, with uh, people from the government. So we had Dr. Nehmer uh, and Simon Kennedy uh, providing uh, a lot of input and support into the work that we did. One thing that is interesting about uh, the, the process that we had, it was a very human process. It was not a process where we had the council to meet, small group talking to each other and writing the report in a kind of closed room. It was very open. We did a lot of consultation across the country. We were able to get input from consultation over 100 consultation. And thank you for Polytechnics because we had a very nice conversation with you and very solid proposal. We had also surveys. So we, I think that it's fair to say that the report is not our report. It's a collective report of the thinking that we had working together, but also the combination, the consolidation of a lot of input that we receive from different groups across the country. And that's what, in my view, makes this report uh, a little bit different than other reports. If we go to the um, next slide, what I'd like to do is to take the time to share with you the structure of the report and the rationale of the report. When we started the work, in fact, in June, the visibility about what was going on in the country was not very good. It was difficult to understand the impacts of that you know, crisis um, across the country in terms of the impact on different sectors, you know, different um, um, uh, regions. And, um, and, and in fact, we, were, we received at that point in time, a lot of input very short term. So people were talking about urgent matters. 
because some people were very badly affected by the crisis. But at the same time, when we did the consultation, July, August, with different groups of people, including people within government, we had other people doing quite well. And we came, of course, with the observation that the crisis and the pandemic at this point in time doesn't have an even if impact on everybody. And in that context, we had people talking about mid long term issues and other people looking at short term issues. So we and, and some people were talking about problems. Other people were talking about solutions. So we took a lot of time, in fact, uh, end of July, August, just to decide what could be the framework to consolidate all that important information that we are getting across the country. And we came with the structure of the report with three phases. One, very short term, restart. How we can restart building confidence of Canadians to restart the economy in a way that is secure. And well, at that point in time, we said to the government, we are quite sure that we will be facing a second wave, maybe a third wave, and that we will need to probably manage 2021 with a, you know, an approach that will be um, kind of very challenging. And by the way, we are still facing those situations right now. So the concept was to come with very short-term recommendations uh, about testing, about borders, and frankly speaking, uh, part of our recommendations were introduced. Other are still, I guess, uh, in debate at different levels within the government at this point in time. The second um, um, part of the recommendation on the short-term basis for the restart of the economy was about the fact that we need to stabilize and secure some artists, its sectors. And of course, no surprise, airlines, airport, aerospace, part of the energy sector, especially in the Western part of Canada, tourism, hospitality, and culture. And this is obvious, you will say to me, but this is not so easy because most of the time in Canada, we like to have, you know, an approach. We want to have support program that will fit everybody equally. And in this particular case, that's not the reality that the crisis is in fact having an impact that is equal for everybody. So we have, we had, and we still have to push a little bit the government to understand that we need to have a more targeted approach to deal with some of those issues. The second phase, and, and I think that this should inspire the government in the budget, is much more, we, can, we were able to observe the, the drop in the GDP and the economic growth in 2020. So the concept here is that how we can accelerate the growth um, building on some very good programs uh, that are already there within the federal government in particular to accelerate uh, the growth uh, looking forward. And you can see the first is very important. We, it, it's not just by coincidence that it is the first. The first uh, recommendation is about talent and workforce innovation. And that's directly connected to the role of Polytechnic, in my view. So we might uh, discuss further uh, that aspect. And of course, we uh, have other recommendations on innovation ecosystem, which is also connected to the first. Access to capital, strategic infrastructure. We came with the idea that it's not just physical infrastructure that are important with the bank, but it is also the digital infrastructure, which is also connected to talent and innovation. Agile regulation and procurement. The third phase um, that we have in this plan, because you can see it's a, it's a well articulated action plan, it's to look at the future. And we came to the, to the conclusion again, based on feedback and input, that we need to have a clear, robust industrial strategy in this country. We don't have it per se. Other countries, no doubt about China, no doubt about Australia, Germany, 
And, and, and of course, you know, uh, United States with their Buy America to a certain extent, they have a very well aligned industrial strategy. And it's time for us to proceed with that. And again, it's a very difficult topic uh, because for some people having an industrial strategy, it means, um, you know, picking winners and losers, but that's not the case. It is to identify some key pillars and the pillars identify are around digital, ESG resources, clean tech, advanced manufacturing and agri-food, building strong ecosystem and a set of policies around talent, infrastructure, procurement that will help to position Canadian firms, Canadian companies and the country uh, in a way that is more competitive, more productive, and certainly as leaders in the world facing this new geopolitics and new geoeconomics. Um, essentially, this, I would say, strategy is supported in the report by a very significant program for investments. So the restart is about support program, Recover, reimagine, it's, it's about investment programs. And we are talking about 100 billion of public money, private money uh, over a period of 10 years in order to get additional growth of at least 1% by 2030. And in order to get there, you need to bring, and that's a condition uh, very important for the success of this uh, action plan, is to have a renewed private sector partnership with the public sector. And again, that's a very interesting conversation for Polytechnics, I think. And, 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 and of course, with a sound and rigorous fiscal frame, framework. What is very interesting with the report, and I will stop there, is the fact that we were able with Fronda, with John and other colleagues to push further some of those broad recommendations into deep sectoral insights and recommendation, and I will leave them to talk about it. I will conclude at this point in time, I will not uh, show any more uh, slides, saying that you may say that the report is very high level uh, in terms of the recommendations. And the reality is that you are right when you say that. And we did it for two reasons. First of all, uh, we wanted to be uh, fast in coming back to the government. We didn't want to be on this thing for 18 months and have the train to pass in front of us and be too late in the crisis. So we wanted to share, in fact, the report was submitted to the government and the minister at the end of October because we felt that there was an urgent situation and we felt that there was value to share recommendation sooner than later. The second reason is that in debating with government, more and more we are specific, more and more it could be complicated into the implementation and the discussion with the government. So we felt that it was better to stay high level. And if there is an appetite from different parties, stakeholders, and the government to move forward, it will be time for us with the sectoral tables and the ISC to go deeper into the recommendation. And certainly this will be part of the conversation today. So I will turn back to you, Randa, and after that, John, if you want to add, and I would propose to remove uh, the, the slides from the screen. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Monique, for the, the introduction to the work. And thank you, Pauline Techniques, for the invitation uh, to be here and to present and answer questions today. Uh, I think John and I, of the nine council members working under Monique, were the most vocal on uh, workforce innovation and upskilling and reskilling. And, and John and I landed on this kind of workforce innovation strategy, which I would assume is, is the thing that you're most interested in talking about today. So, so John and I are, I'm not gonna speak for John, but I, we're, we're thrilled to be here to, to have that discussion. And certainly from my perspective, you know, I'm looking forward to shedding a bit of light on uh, the she session and, and the work that needs to be done to make sure that um, we're re-engaging women and visible minorities that were more deeply impacted 
in the loss of jobs uh, in this uh, pandemic, you know, how are we going to work together to make sure we lift those people back into the economy? And, you know, those are the kinds of things that keep me up at night. And, and I look forward to sharing some of my thoughts today. I won't add much more because I know Larry's got a long list of good questions for us. So, uh, but I, I will say uh, it was a true pleasure to work uh, uh, with the council and and uh, to have uh, Monique as a chair. You know, as the CEO of a company, uh, quite often your your chat your your task is to set some of the challenges and and let others do the work. And in this case, uh, it was a great opportunity to actually roll up the sleeves, listen very carefully to the problems across the country and start to develop, uh, I think, very meaningful strategy and solutions and recommendations into government on how to tackle some of these challenges. Uh, and so it was a joy, uh, Monique, to spend, uh, you know, sometimes 40, 50 hours a week <laughs> over and above the regular day job uh, supporting uh, this effort. And, uh, and I think there's a real impact that can be had if, if all of us across Canada rally around this report and its recommendations. Uh, we'll get into the workforce pieces and we'll get into other pieces, but one that I'll highlight in particular as well is the, the rapid digitization across all the different uh, industries. So uh, it was news to me as I looked at the data that the world economy is gonna flip to digital or digitally transformed over the course of the next three to four years. That's about a $38 trillion uh, transformation of the world economy in a very short time frame uh, from where it is today. And so, you know, we, we, <laughs> there's an urgency attached to this report uh, like no other in terms of either capturing the opportunities that are presented, not wasting, uh, as the old adage is, not wasting the crisis that's in front of us to enact change, to set a different future for Canada, uh, put us on a different uh, path forward. So uh, Monique, thank you for being an amazing chair. And, uh, and as a first time council member, it was a real, uh, real joy to put in this work. Well, that's well, thank great, you. thank you, John. And, and thank you, Monique, for that, that overview. Uh, and I have to say thank you, Monique, John, and Rhonda for, for the, this important work that you've done in, in, in taking this on. I mean, as CEO, uh, I know you're very busy. Um, you've got a lot on your agenda, uh, but busy people get things done. And uh, kudos to, to all of you for stepping up and taking on this important work. So, uh, so let's get started with, with our panel discussion and some of the questions that we've uh, prepared for you. Again, I'll remind uh, our members on the line that if you have any questions, just put them in the chat box uh, and we'll, we'll try and get to them as we go through the, the questions and the panels here. So I guess my first question, and maybe it's to you, John, um, um, as you consider the recommendations, um, where do you see the publicly funded educational institutions making their most valuable contributions? Well, I think uh, there's, there's really a few key areas. Uh, one, I, I do think there's a role that government needs to play, by the way, just before we get to the, where, where uh, educational institutions can really help. I do think there's a need uh, to respond from the emergency perspective too with uh, post-secondary education across the country, because uh, many of the universities and colleges and polytechs have not been equipped to make this kind of a pivot to digital so fast. And so investing in uh, taking these programs and providing a high quality online experience is, is very important. And also just making sure that the physical locations at these different campuses is ready for that transition. So some of those recommendations uh, were well supported by the council in, in terms of our conversations with government, just uh, I want to preface that. And then in terms of the report, uh, where a lot of the work went into is uh, the upskilling and reskilling of the economy. Uh, and so there's millions of Canadians that have been impacted by this pandemic. Uh, at least a million are still looking for work. And so there's a real opportunity, I think, for the Polytechs to help uh, reskill this workforce, not through traditional EI programs, in my opinion, uh, but to really take a hard look at what are these uh, long-term high demand areas uh, and how do we actually provide the right education to these folks that are currently displaced over the course of the next few months or, or even year or more to get them back into a high demand area of our economy versus the first available job. So there's, there's a real opportunity potentially to do some innovation here uh, in how we do things to take the right long-term approach and, and getting people back on their feet properly, if you will. Um, I think there's also a, uh, a big effort on the research and development side as well. You know, there's, there's no shortage of challenges in terms of how to engage with uh, companies to, to spark innovation. But if we're going to build world leading companies in Canada, and this report has that ambition, then that demands an, a new strategy in terms of how we actually collaborate together 
um, to build uh, that world-class research uh, ca capability and, and have that talent flow nicely into these organizations and to support the research that's gonna be required to help them become world leaders in their niches. Um, I also think there's a third area around retention of talent and Monique will probably add a few more, but uh, I'll just give you my three. Uh, we see uh, the loss of a lot of new grads in, in particular areas like uh, software, software engineering or software development. Upwards of 66% uh, was the data that I saw. Uh, they leave the country uh, out of the gate. And so I think uh, spots like Saskatchewan have tackled this with um, you know, uh, retention grants for students that stay within the province. Uh, I don't know if, there's, if that's the right answer, but we're certainly looking for recommendations like that to not necessarily stop people from leaving. We don't want to do that. That's a path that's well established, but to uh, encourage them to stay because we're going to need the talent to power this digital transformation and all the other transformations that are happening, frankly, across all these different sectors and industries. There was one universal across all thousand plus CEOs that I think we talked to was this need for upskilling and reskilling. Uh, it came across very clearly, even in the hardest hit sectors, the need for us to uh, tackle that with both people that have been displaced, but really importantly, it was a, it was a very consistent in terms of uh, trying to upskill the people that are still in these companies uh, to be able to handle the transformations that they're going through right now today. That's terrific, thank you. And you know, infrastructure for a long time was thought bricks and mortar, but in order for us to be innovative and reimagine as your report, one of the phases of the, the report, reimagine the future, it relies on a digital infrastructure, definitely skills uh, and innovation and upskilling is a sweet spot. It's one of our uh, key uh, differentiators and, and something we do very well. And I'll come back to a couple of questions on those points, uh, but thank you for, for that answer, John. Um, does anyone else, uh, maybe I'll, I'll go on to a second part of that one. Um, I guess um, being a polytechnic president, one of the observations, uh, I'm a bit biased, so it was kind of glaring to me uh, after reading the report that polytechnics and colleges were never mentioned as part of the toolkit that government could use to address the pandemic uh, recovery and uh, response to recovery. Um, can maybe, uh, maybe Monique, can you address or explain that absence? Um, and, and just as important, if not more important, um, if the CEOs um, like yourselves on the panel are not aware of the supports uh, that are available to them by polytechnic institutes, what can we do or how can we help to raise that awareness? Well, let me again, um, thank you for the question. I think it's very good that uh, we can talk uh, very openly about it and it may uh, bring uh, all of us uh, to do uh, other things that uh, could uh, uh, bring all of us somewhere else. Um, as I said, the way uh, we put together the framework and the recommendations uh, was very uh, high level. We wanted to provide a direction. We wanted to provide the concept. Uh, but if you go, it's not just for this particular recommendation on talent, but if you go into the report, you will see that we are more aligned with concept than specific, uh, I guess, connections to any kind of organization. And, and I guess that we did that a little bit on purpose. It was a question of time, but it was also a question of opening the idea and, and getting into the implementation at another time. So that's maybe a little bit the construct, but not the purpose of not being, of course, in touch with uh, uh, polytechnics. Maybe one of the, uh, so, so that's a concept, but maybe Rhonda has something else to add and, and John. Uh, and, and it might be that, uh, you know, following this conversation today, and I said that to Sarah, uh, might be appropriate uh, for you uh, to, to, to come again to the ISC uh, with, uh, you know, a, a more specific uh, recommendation for us to introduce, and it will be our pleasure because we are still in contact. Uh, with uh, different uh, parts of government. Uh, we are part of some of the conversation regarding the budget. So it will be certainly my pleasure and Rhonda and John will certainly support me in, uh, in passing the message. Now, there is something that I would like to mention briefly regarding the question that was um, provided to John. One of the thing, and, and again, this is very personal. We talk about it in the report, but um, 
could be interesting to get your perspective uh, later in the conversation. We look at uh, different models outside Canada and not saying it is perfect, but uh, we felt that uh, the approach that was introduced in Germany, for example, with the dual system, uh, you know, uh, bring together uh, groups of institutions similar uh, um, to polytechnics with businesses uh, and other, you know, partners is probably something that we need to do more in Canada. Uh, as a business person, I work with different companies in Canada and outside Canada. And, and, and what I found uh, being something still a challenge, and that's something that uh, hopefully we will be able to make progress, is a better alignment of business needs, uh, current and future with the um, uh, with uh, the institutions and the programs and the skillings and the upskillings and the fast skilling um, programs that are offered. That's not easy. That's not easy because it is kind of uh, a journey. It evolves. So that piece is probably the one that is the most important one in my mind. If we are able, uh, with your support, to me, to, to, to move the needle in Canada with this better alignment uh, of business needs with uh, institution. And I think that Polytechnic is so well positioned, my view, uh, like some of the CEGEP uh, and college, um, depending the way you are, you know, uh, putting the qualification of the institution, uh, this would be great. And also this will help the innovation agenda. Uh, because I think that a lot of innovation are not necessarily done in R&D lab uh, uh, in, uh, you know, connected with universities, but very often are closely connected with institutions that are able to work closely with businesses. I will stop there. Maybe, Rhonda, you have other views on that. Sure, That's thank terrific. You. Yeah, Rhonda, go ahead. Thanks. I'll just add just a little bit more. So... Uh, this is an area that, that I really pushed the council uh, on was the workforce innovation strategy. So it was clear as we talked to all stakeholders that there were skilling gaps and needs and at every phase of employment from, you know, beginning of career, mid-career, end career, there were all these problems. So it just became really clear to really package all of this into a workforce innovation strategy. Not to say that we have that strategy, but we understand what it needs to do and needs to reflect and who needs to be involved with that. And of course, you'll be involved with that. So we see this as a big pillar of work that uh, will likely be funded through the budget and it would be... Um, executed in a similar way that we've seen in the uh, financial update, uh, Minister Freeland talked about women in the economy. So I know she's actively engaging with people to sit on that council. And, and I would see this workforce innovation strategy, although the tables will be working sectorally on this, that this is a really big opportunity for Canada to get this right and to get all levels of the reskilling and upskilling and first skilling sorted out and really have this national mandate around lifelong learning. And so if you're looking from a strategy point for polytechniques, you know, how do you align yourselves uh, with students, with, with the general public along lifelong learning? Like how, how do you have a meaningful impact to make sure people are always coming back to get little bits and pieces, uh, I guess would be kind of something I'd put back on you because pre-recession, my sector had so many jobs without people. And of course, in Canada, we have people without jobs. And uh, pre-recession, that was 75,000 jobs without people in my, just my sector, which is 10% of employment in Canada. Uh, today, we have still 35,000 jobs unfilled. So these problems are, are still here and we haven't fixed them. And I think that uh, we've learned to do things differently in the pandemic. And uh, so with this workforce innovation strategy, I think we're going to be able to get this right and really look at demand-driven, smart skilling, fast skilling, cross-credentialization, all these great things. And we look forward to working with you. That's terrific. And a lot of that is music to our ears because that's really a strength and a sweet spot for polytechnics and what we do. Our industry connections, uh, I agree with you, are, are probably, yeah. probably stronger than any other post-secondary. Um, and, and 
you know, the whole idea of upskilling and reskilling, it was featured prominently in your report and uh, that all sectors stand to benefit from this. And I've got some questions coming in from uh, the members as well. But uh, before that, I just want, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that, again, that it is a key strength area of ours. We have a combined catalog between all 13 members of 17,000 offerings of short courses that can be used for reskilling and upskilling, con ed, professional development, corporate training. We have services like PLAR, prior uh, learning and assessment and recognition. We have bridging uh, training, bridge training, um, advanced placement to facilitate labor market transitions, and more recently, micro credentials. And, uh, and that's one of the questions that was posed by the members in, in the audience. Where do micro credentials fit into the report and or recommendations? Uh, and had you thought about that? Rantab, would you like to go ahead with sure. that? Yeah, I mean, this is again, a big part of the workforce innovation strategy. This is a place that I've spent a lot of time you know, and I can give you perspective, you know, in my own company, I have people that are employed and that this digitization train is coming and, you know, the manufacturing 4.0, it's coming through and I need to be fast skilling the people that work for me and they don't have time to leave employment and go back to school. So these micro credentials and these fast skilling opportunities are, are just vitally important to keep people employed and, and also thinking about skilling people where they live. That's another big thing that, that I want you to think about. And I think the pandemic's taught mm -hmm. us more about that, that we really need to ensure that, you know, if people want to live in a rural community and work in a rural community, that they can be skilled there as well. Well, that, that and the jobs are going to be there for them because uh, now you can actually work from anywhere. So a lot of the disruptions of the pandemic have really opened up opportunities in those rural communities as well where, you know, typically if an industry left, the town would get hollowed out. So, you know, we've got some really unique opportunities here. Uh, you know, and by the way, specifically around micro-credentials, it's in the report, it's in the recommendations uh, around that. Uh, you know, and, and none of us have forgotten the strength of the polytext, by the way, as this, uh, as this went along. Uh, you know, I think the government, uh, the federal level thinks of both uh, education as a provincial matter, just for clarity. So we spent a lot of time trying to craft sort of almost like a puzzle piece coming together, you know, making sure that the workforce innovation strategy lines in nicely with uh, what we would be doing in the education sector. So I, I, I do believe that that is the case, um, you know, and, and I think it, you'll see it's the one key recommendation that's actually be through all three steps uh, from restart to recover to reimagine is this workforce innovation strategy. It's uh, become sort of cross-sectorial in nature and also across all, all three of these phases that we're gonna go through. Um, and, and I would just add like uh, Rhonda, just like you, we're, we're actually just rolling out a new, a new product internally at D2L and we're rolling it out to our, our people first. And, and it's literally, here are all the skills that we think D2L is gonna need for the future and how that maps back to academic programs that are within our client base so they can register through like almost an education benefit strategy. So they get, um, you know, a certain uh, two or $3,000 a year to continue to stay sharp in their skills in these high demand areas that we have. And so micro credentials play a big role in that because, you know, as, as you can imagine, many SMEs are not gonna be able to afford to send people back to school for two to three years or four years uh, for full programs that have full uh, costs attached to them, but they, they could afford something. Uh, and so being able to have these things stack uh, and grow will help keep uh, employees um, sharp as we make these transitions for the future. So I, pl I applaud the work that the Polytechs are doing in this space. Yeah, another point I'd just add there is, you know, taking a really good look at the timelines of credentialing and micro-credentialing micro that, you know, the workplace doesn't work in that same linear semester fashion. So we need to rethink that, you know, I've got employees right now, I wanna put through a PMP program and the courses don't start until September. And it's like, are you kidding me? Like my people need this now, <laughs> you know? So it, it's really creating that linkage that, you know, academics and workplace can, understand the dynamic that we need to work together and, and push people through the skilling programs at the pace of business and at the pace of change right now. Larry, there Good is uh, something Good. that uh, from a conceptual point of view uh, is not easy uh, because even though at the federal level, we can come with, let's say a strategy 
um, workforce innovation uh, building on the conversation we are having. The next step is to get you know, the same commitment at the provincial level and have the flexibility, the agility of the different parties to move forward and to a certain extent to align, uh, let's say the training with the business needs, it cannot be defined centrally. It has to be defined at a level that is very close to the marketplace and sometimes very local, very regional. So the role of all the people who are very well connected within communities, within uh, where Rhonda, you, you are with your business becomes so critical. So I guess that what I'm saying is that how can we with that kind of report and policy bring the right uh, aspiration, but making sure to provide enough flexibility in the system to make sure that the people who will be in contact, um, you know, in the communities will be able to proceed and will have the flexibility and the legitimacy to proceed swiftly on some of the opportunities. And I think that um, it's uh, easier said than, than done, but if we are able to put the conditions to be successful there, it will be a, a big advantage for the country. And it works. We know that if you go across Canada, even in Quebec, because the system is slightly different there, there are some uh, important success, but we need to multiply best practices. And I'm sure that with the people who are connected with us today, we've got some of those successes and we need to share those uh, best practices around the country. Well, thank you, for Monique, Ron and John for those, for those comments. Um, I have a question from one of the, uh, the presidents uh, of the Polytechnics on the line. And it says, we talk about reskilling up skilling, we focus on getting people the training they need. How do we create a system uh, so that employers can better find and identify potential employees? John, would you I'm like to get sure who wants to share that? No, uh, Laura Joe, always a pleasure uh, to get a question from you. Uh, congratulations again on your new, uh, new role at Nate. Uh, you know, uh, that's not an easy one either. Uh, so helping folks uh, transition into the workplace is a really big priority. Uh, so a lot of work's going into a work integrated learning strategy across the country today. And I think it's really just gearing up to help people, you know, that are going through these programs that you're offering, get the skills uh, in that particular industry to help build connections to employers in, in the region. That's one pathway that I would uh, continue to make sure that we strengthen and support. Uh, and then I think there's also, uh, you know, a need for us to, to do a much better job in terms of bringing employers to our campuses, finding the talent, making it part of their hiring strategies. Uh, and so I, I, I'll once again, you know, lean in on Saskatchewan as a good example of this in terms of creating uh, on ramps for people to stay within the province uh, through making uh, these grants available to encourage employers that wouldn't necessarily um, uh, hire new grads to, to start hiring them. Because as Rhonda pointed out in technology, you know, it's, I think we still have about a quarter of a million roles still open in technology uh, and largely unfulfilled roles for the last, as long as I can remember. Uh, and so we've got uh, a real talent shortage and, uh, and it's just gonna get worse and worse as things go uh, further and faster. Uh, and so the more that we can do to build strong connections between industry and academia, the easier it is for folks to find those opportunities. Thanks, I would add to uh, what you are saying, John, is that um, I think that, uh, curiously enough, the, uh, the crisis will have, going forward, significant impacts, certainly into healthcare, no doubt about it, but certainly in the education sector. And one of the reasons is technology <coughs> and, and digital oh. innovation. Uh, because uh, by definition, I, I think that the crisis for many of us, uh, including you as professional in your sectors and your institutions uh, and, and employees and, and students, we are getting used in getting what we need without constraint, without boundaries. 
And, and I think that, uh, and I'm saying that uh, again with a reference maybe more into Quebec because that's the province where I am and it's sometimes slightly different when you compare to the rest uh, of uh, the country. It's fascinating because you have the best minds in our education system, could be at universities, college, you know, high schools and so forth. But it's not naturally the space where you will be getting a lot of adaptation to change and a lot of innovation in the way, uh, in fact, uh, education will be provided to people. There's a lot of different parties and stakeholders sometimes uh, limiting, and I'm, and I'm I'm speaking myself, I'm not talking about the report, I'm speaking, you know, what I can observe, I'm passionate about education um, as a per business person. And we need to find a way to capitalize on the best minds that we have and, and eliminate a little bit the constraints that unfortunately, sometimes I found that our education system is, uh, is, um, is putting uh, against the possibilities that some institutions uh, could have. That, that's a personal comment at this point in time, Larry. I'm sorry, but just to put a little bit of, I uh, guess, uh, conversation around this topic. So there was a follow-up question there from from Laura that I, that I might take. It was for John, but uh, he has a he has a mid-sized company. I have a small company, so I'll answer that. Uh, so on the the hundred micro credentialed people applying to my company, it's it's a really good question, and I'm actively hiring and going through this a lot, and I'm really pushing my team to look at resumes differently. But I also sit on the board of Palette, and I think many of you might know of this disruptor, Dr. Arvind Gupta, in this upskilling, reskilling space, and it's kind of like micro-credentialing. Um, but a big part of that is, and, and a role for you to play, is to help your students um, be able to present themselves better. So in my company, I'm always looking for a unicorn you know? And so it's hard to find that on a resume. So how do you have hard skills and then, you know, give the coaching that's required to your students to present themselves so their resume stands off the page that, you know, this is somebody that's really going to stretch themselves that they can apply, they think they can apply this skill in, in different ways. And so that that's really what I'm looking at. And what I've learned through my work with Palette is, you know, in particular, when we bring in economic immigrants and they're dual degree, they get their second degree in Canada and they can't get a job. They haven't been coached how to get a job here in Canada and they go and they work for a grocery store. Then every company that looks at that resume thinks mm, they work at no frills like, ugh. you know, so it's it's really trying to help people position themselves because there's so many highly credentialed people that are just not making the cut on desks like mine. I think that uh, the point, Rhonda, is, uh, is great. And uh, I, we, we are talking in the report about the importance of internship uh, and, and co-op programs, uh, because I think that we are uh, having a, a, a kind of contrasted situation of vacant positions where it is difficult, you know, to, to get the right people. And on the other end, people who have completed their studies and not yet uh, align or match. So we have this kind of polarized situation and we need to find uh, ways to make sure to, I don't like the word integrate, but to, to have, you know, our students to, and including the foreign students uh, to get, uh, you know, their, um, their role in society and, and with a good job and where they can contribute. That, that's a, a very good point, uh, Monique. And Rhonda, when we talk about some of those uh, softer skills, um, and it kind of transitions into the next question I have around applied research. So practicums, work integrated learning, and we're well on our way to having 100% of our programs uh, have a work integrated learning component into them. But another area of the report, uh, and, and it's an area where our students also get some of those skills, project management skills, listening skills, presentation skills, as well as, as taking all of their knowledge and, and, and and solving problems. Um, it's in the area 
of boosting, um, and the, the, the report talked about the idea of boosting investment in innovation and commercialization. And um, one of the key messages we've been delivering to the government uh, that is small businesses in, in Canada, for the most part, is comprised of SMEs. Uh, they don't have in-house R&D capability or capacity, but they can leverage polytechnic applied research capacity to do that. And we take industry problems, bring them into the classroom, and our students solve those problems. In fact, polytechnics serve as local gateways uh, to the innovation ecosystem for thousands of business partners every year. Uh, digital technology adoption, testing, prototyping, design demonstration, process improvement. Um, our 13 members conducted last year more than 3,300 research projects for 2,375 industry partners. And the demand isn't going away. Even with COVID, it has increased over the past 12 months. So within that context, um, did the council get a sense of the type of innovation support that's most needed by business right now? And what are some of the barriers that, that you heard uh, through your consultations? Is it funding? Is it expertise? Is it navigating? Uh, or, or some combination of all of the above? Well, maybe I can start and have John and Rhonda uh, to compete because they are, you know, really in that space, maybe more than uh, uh, I am. Uh, but I think that if you think about some SMEs, uh, many of them are very busy, just, and, and, and some of them are badly affected also by the crisis. So my own view is that um, there is an opportunity, and we have that in the report, for government to provide the right financial incentive for SMEs to invest more into that kind of, I would say, project uh, to stimulate innovation and to stimulate adoption of digital technology as one example. And, and, and I think that um, doing that, there will be two impacts. There will be additional, of course, public money, but this will bring also additional private investment from the SME to support. And this will also create probably additional value for the business and also provide an opportunity for you know, uh, uh, the employees to continue to grow and learn. So it is a, a kind of positional, po positive circle uh, that you can create with, uh, with that. And uh, we were able to come up with some preliminary figures to uh, support the government in this kind of uh, thinking. Maybe John and Rhonda, back to you. Thanks, Benny. Well, just, um, I, I guess a couple points. Um, you know, as, as you look at the challenge of trying to build world leading capacity within Canada, by the way, your point is accurate. I, I didn't realize how much that was true. I didn't realize uh, that there's only a very small fraction of our economy that's uh, large companies. 0.2% uh, of the companies in Canada are large, over 500 employees. That's that's a small number. Uh, on our, you know, on my business council trips to Germany, we, you know, 36% of the GDP for Germany is in this upper middle category of uh, companies that are that are over, you know, a certain size, but still under that what they would determine as large. <laughs> so, so we're missing a, a big uh, part of our economy in terms of not not producing companies to scale. So I, th I think it's not one or the other. We've got to find way an innovation strategy here that supports SMEs because that's what Canada is today, supports uh, creating world leading companies and supports making sure that our, our large companies remain, thrive uh, on the other side of this pandemic, survive it and then thrive hopefully on the growth curves that occur afterwards. Um, I think what most companies are saying is I need help navigating surviving uh, the pandemic in terms of the different sectors that are hard hit. Uh, which is why we targeted, you know, those three sectors in particular saying, you know, we need these sectors, like we need our airlines to survive so that uh, post pandemic, as you look at the curves, they're all growth curves <laughs> that, you know, they should thrive during that period. So if they can get through that reset, then it makes it a lot easier for them to, to achieve growth on the other side. So some of it's just economic attached to that uh, in terms of coming up with strategies around how to, how to help them navigate through that. But, you know, the growth should be there on the other side of it. Uh, but the bigger one in my mind is around the digital transformation. And I, and I think if we're going to build world leading um, capacity here, it shouldn't just be about creating a country of consumers of digital. We should be a country of producers of digital. We shouldn't just be, you know, uh, drawers of water and hewers of wood, right? We should, we should modernize. We should uh, 
really build world-class uh, digital companies across all sectors. Could be energy, agri-tech, uh, digital like natives su such as our company. It could be um, in the healthcare space. We really should uh, start putting in the investments today across uh, all of our uh, sectors, whether it's education or companies alike, into making sure that we're ready to capture that opportunity that's in front of us. That demands major change, urgent action. And this report has about nine pillars in it uh, that uh, anchor uh, how, do, how do we actually navigate that transformation without it going off the rails in one way or another. It's, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about, well, how do we do this in a way that allows Canada to capture the opportunity, not squander it? So, you know, I'm happy to talk more about that too. And you're right, John, digital is transversal. It's horizontal. It goes to across each sector. And it's very good to develop, of course, uh, digital industries into a vertical pillar. But it is so important, especially for the SMEs, to uh, upgrade their capacity in terms of uh, digital um, uh, innovation. And in that context, my view is that it's a great opportunity, especially for the SME and even for the medium-sized companies for polytechnics uh, to come in, into play uh, because we need to move forward. The direction is very clear from the report. It is essential not just for digital companies, but for all the sectors and the needs are huge. So I guess that for all of you, there is a space there that you can certainly, um, uh, you know, seize if, uh, if uh, you look for, you know, a big item for you to play. That's terrific. And, and you're right. Uh, you know, it's my belief that every industry and every sector will become a, a technology, a digital company. The ones most successful in transitioning and I don't even like the word anymore, pivot, it's been used so much through the pandemic, but have been successful in carrying on with their operations have been the ones that have employed digital technologies. We're seeing those organizations and some organizations coming to us for help with that, either reskilling their employees or actually helping them implement uh, that digital platform. So a real opportunity for sure. We're running short on time here. We have about five more minutes. I'm gonna to skip to the last question. Uh, as you can tell, there's lots of interest and lots of questions, but can, can you tell us um, through all of, um, I guess, next steps, what happens, the so what, uh, where you see Industry Strategy Council and the economic tables going next? Okay, so I think I will ask Rhonda, John, and first, and I will conclude uh, after them. Sure. Thanks. So uh, we do have an additional mandate to go and chair our sectoral tables. We're waiting for the announcement for that work to begin. That would be a federal announcement, but uh, we are, um, you know, we're at the ready to, to do that work and to fully engage the sector on the pillars, you know, and I, I think um, just, just one other point around your last question is that, uh, you know, the big word of the, uh, in, of the department we work for, of the report is around innovation. And, you know, I think we have to get really innovative about innovation because, you know, like everything we do in this federation, it's all siloed, you know, polytechnics are siloed, the sectors are siloed, provinces are siloed regions are siloed. So let's start thinking about how we get out of our silos and we have cross-cutting uh, initiatives to really move the dial and to truly be innovative together. Couldn't agree more, Rhonda. Uh, you know, I think that was one of the things that was a light bulb moment for me is listening to how uh, by working together across all those traditional silos, how we can actually come up with some really creative solutions that are going to help build Canada as a world leader. Uh, for me, it's really two key things that I'm going to be zeroed in on. One's sort of this workforce innovation strategy. Uh, and the second is uh, around the digital strategy uh, to support uh, a concept we call the Borealis Digital Network. It kind of light touch in there, but it's a really big idea to not only transform uh, the Canadian economy, but also to support uh, outposts all over the world and helping to drive Canadian technology adoption globally, uh, creating a trusted infrastructure uh, thinking about infrastructure broader than simply roads and ports, thinking about software infrastructure coming from Canada to support the world. So a uh, really big idea. Uh, can't wait to, to roll up the sleeves and dig in on that effort as well too. 
Well, uh, John, uh, we had so uh, many conversations around this concept of the Borealis uh, network, and uh, it's uh, fantastic. And uh, I will certainly support you and all the people interested in that uh, concept. I would say uh, two uh, elements uh, to uh, conclude. I think that the tables will have, and the ISC will have an important role to play uh, to help the government uh, to move forward with the implementation of all or some of the recommendations. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, we are in a situation where we need to bring the best of all the minds working together without boundaries, without silos, uh, connecting the private sector and, and the public sector. And in that context, I think the sectoral tables and the ISC is a very useful tool for the government. It is neutral to a certain extent, but it is also providing a lot of momentum and connection to the reality. And my last comment would be that the report is your report. Take it, you know, if you like, you know, certain proposals uh, that you feel are, you know, good, appropriate, take them. No issue. It's a public report. We want to share it with you. If you want to improve some of the recommendations, if you want to expand on some of the recommendations, go ahead, please. Keep us informed and we will, you know, try to uh, communicate the message uh, because the, the role that you play as an uh, important organization in the country, not just for you as being part of the uh, institution, but for all the people you help in helping them, them to learn how to learn, because at the end of the day, this is what we need to do, I think. Um, I would like to say a big thank you and don't hesitate uh, to use this report as a leverage for your conversation. That's a great invitation, uh, Monique, and thank you for that. And unfortunately, we're out of time. We could have scheduled another couple of hours and, and had this conversation go on and on and on. But uh, on behalf of all my friends and, and, and colleagues on the line, I really want to thank uh, you, Monique and, and John and, and Rhonda, for being here today, for uh, giving us a little better insight and understanding of the report. Um, and, and offering, um, you know, for us to be a little proactive as well, not sit back and wait for, for what's next, but to be proactive in that, that exercise as well. I know, um, I know, and I think what's important for you to know is polytechnic institutions are, are well positioned to support and deliver on a number of your recommendations, particularly given the important role that skill, talent, um, and, and the role that innovation ecosystem will play in Canada's post-pandemic recovery. Uh, we continue and we will continue to follow the implementation phase with great interest. Uh, so on behalf of all Polytech Canada members, um, uh, invite the Industry Strategy Council and the Economic Strategy Tables, again, to call on us with, with, when needed. But again, we've also heard the message that we need to proactive and, and, and college of as well. So I'm confident that college, that Polytechnics uh, will be able to assist in a number of areas we discussed today. And finally, um, again, um, on behalf of all of us, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the work that you've done. It's really important work for Canada and for our recovery. And we look forward with, with great interest to uh, next steps. Thank you so Goodbye, much. Goodbye, everyone. Okay. Have Bye -bye. a great rest of the day. Great seeing you. Thank you. Bye.